Welcome to another episode of Head First with Dr. Hill. This is your vodcast on all things brain and how to lean into it and get some science, get some in inspiration about what is happening inside that three pounds of jelly sitting on top of your shoulders. Today's guest is Ryan Muncy. Ryan is a personal trainer and nutritionist. He's also the chief optimizer at Natural Stacks and works with a wide variety of clients, including athletes from around the world, help them optimize their brains. Uh, Ryan's the host of the Optimal Performance Podcast that actually I was a guest on not, not too long ago. And he is a two-time best-selling author, has two books, The Nutrition Blueprint and Abs for Athletes. That's kind of, kind of exciting. Yeah. So, um, Ryan, uh, why don't you tell us a little more about you, what you're doing, uh, what do you keep your days busy with uh, as a biohacker? Yeah, so um, I guess for the longest time, uh, or for as long as I can remember, I've just been obsessed with uh, elite human performance, whether okay. it's in the mental or physical realm. And, and I think anybody who has seen it or experienced it, you know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. And it, it's almost a, a mesmerizing thing. And uh, I got to witness it firsthand in college. And um, it's just been a pursuit ever since then to, you know, optimize it for myself, but to figure out the mechanics behind it. How do we achieve it? How do we get there? And, and how do I help other people do the same thing? Uh, and it has evolved uh, over the the course of 10 or 12 years, mm -hmm. you know, my, I started with weightlifting and bodybuilding and that became fitness model, moved to New York, um, did that. That wasn't really where I wanted to be. Okay. Uh, I thought that that would give me a platform. Uh -huh. I knew I needed uh -huh. some sort of platform for people to listen to me. Yeah. Um, but it turned out, you know, that that was a little bit more of a superficial world to live in than I wanted to Modeling? be Modeling? I can't imagine. Uh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, who, who would know? <laughs> so I moved back home to Roanoke. I uh, was a personal trainer, started my gym, House of Strength, in 2012, mm -hmm. warehouse-style uh, performance-based training. And uh, from there, got really heavily involved in biohacking, was listening to Dave Asprey, Joe Rogan. Sure, sure. Um, and... That's where I was introduced to natural stacks and things just started snowballing with them. I knew I wanted to get out of the gym to be able to help more people okay. on a daily basis yep. and reach a wider variety of people instead of just the people who lived in Roanoke, Virginia. Sure, sure. Uh, so it was just kind of everything timed perfectly. Um, got married. My wife finished residency. She's a, a physician. Oh, and, wonderful. Uh, we knew that we were going to be moving, so we moved to Virginia Beach recently and uh, so she's internal medicine hospitalist, and uh, I get to be the chief optimizer for natural stacks. And so, what is that? What is a chief optimizer? Uh, it's it's a really cool title, and uh -huh. it's a cool question to answer because uh, no two days are the same for me. Um, you know, right now I'm we're in LA. I'm traveling out here to get my brain hooked up at at Peak Brain Institute. That's right. That's right. We're, we're doing some EEGs, looking at um, you know how my brain works. Uh, basically, being a human guinea pig, testing uh, all realms of biohacking and, and, and performance optimization, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's, you know, uh, things like heart rate training or heart rate variability, uh, whether it's fitness related, whether it's mindfulness or anything that, that can help us it, it, that we can use as a tool. I'm learning it. I'm experiencing it. Um, you know, I get to take advantage of being that curious person by nature. Mm -hmm. We accumulate that information and then we're sharing it with our audience and, and helping as many people as we can put these tools in their toolbox. Great. So, so, you're, so you're both curating information out there as well as producing products. Yeah. Great. Um, so with Natural Stacks, you know, our our mission is to provide all of those tools and all of that information. You know, we do have supplements. We do have the the things that people can, can take on a daily basis to help. Mm -hmm. But we mm -hmm. also realize that, you know, that stuff doesn't work unless you're living the lifestyle that supports sure. the results that you want to get. So we're putting that information out there. We're educating people. So for me, it's, it's the podcast, it's blogs, it's emails, um, okay. you know, helping all of our customers who write in, you know, you mentioned in the intro, helping people all around the world. We've got, um, endurance athletes who are out there doing 100 mile races we've mm -hmm. got uh olympic athletes we've got hollywood celebrities movie stars the the spectrum of people that we get to help is is so cool so varied um it, it's just it's a, it's a blessing to be able to do this it's really so do you still have time to keep yourself healthy and, and fit and uh moving forward in that peak performance biohacking realm or are you still are you working more on helping other people at this point it's definitely been a challenge yeah. uh it, it was something that you know, with given my background in, I mean, I have a degree in food science and human nutrition. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, you know, the strength coach background, used to own a gym. So you would think that those would be things that I could put on autopilot. Sure. And, and I sort of made that mistake uh, over 
the last few months when things got really busy. And, and that's not to say that there was this huge dip, mm -hmm. but it was noticeable to me and, and for me. Sure. Uh, so it's definitely something that I still, even 10, 12 years into it, you know, being as, I don't want to call myself advanced, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, I know what I'm doing, sure, but I sure. still have to focus on it in order to get the results. You still that I have want, to actually so. execute. You can't just uh, be momentum with physical fitness. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. so that has been a little bit of a challenge, but but fortunately, you know, I have people around me who you know kind of give you that that check. Uh, I call it a cock check. I don't know if you can say that on here. I call it a gut <laughs> sure, check, but sure. uh, you know, they they give you that check and you make sure that 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 you move forward and, and you're you're doing what you're supposed to be. I mean, that to me, that's part of accountability and surrounding yourself with people that you know, will hold you accountable and keep you moving forward. Gotcha. That's wonderful. Say, so, hey, let's, let's dig into, into uh, natural stacks a little bit. So, um, you know, I, I of course, uh, helped design a product called True Brain. Um, natural stacks main product is called Siltap. Siltap. I'm somewhat familiar, but actually not thoroughly familiar. Siltap is a blend or a stack, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Like several things. Yeah. So, so for us, the, the stack, uh, is several ingredients included in one formula or mm -hmm. formulation to provide a synergistic effect okay. that is greater than, you know, the individual components. Sure. Uh, so with Siltup, we've got five ingredients, all natural. It is patented. Um, but part of what we do at Natural Stacks is that we're trying to uh, avoid, uh, well, not we're not trying to, we, we do avoid mm -hmm. proprietary blends. But we Good. hate we hate the industry standard of hiding behind proprietary blends. As, as do I. Good. Nice. Well well done. I'm, I'm uh, highly approve of actually disclosing ingredient amounts. Yes. That's nice. Yeah. So yeah. We, we call that open source. Uh, if people uh -huh. are familiar with like coding, you, you know, you have open source code. Uh, it's the open source initiative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we want to know exactly what we're putting in our body. We want to know the ingredients, we want to know the amounts, and we think that the consumers have that right to know as well. Absolutely. So we make sure that that's, you know, f you know forefront on all of our labeling. Um, but with natural stat or with Siltep specifically, we've got um, artichoke extract and forscolin okay. that are the kind of heavy hitters in that. Um, now what is forscolin? So it's an herb. It's a it's a plant, mm -hmm. and it's been used in bodybuilding circles for for a long time to uh, promote fat loss and, and muscle gain. Okay. Uh, but that daily dose is typically somewhere around twenty milligrams. Okay. In Siltep, I think it's a lot closer to four milligrams. Um, but with the artichoke extract, that's actually a PDE four inhibitor. Phosphodiesterase. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. And so by inhibiting that, uh, that that enzyme PDE4 down regulates cyclic AMP. Mm -hmm, sure. So by preventing that, we get a, an indirect boost in cyclic AMP. Okay. And then with forscolin, that is a direct uh, increaser of cyclic AMP. So we get elevated levels of cyclic AMP or CAMP. And what you experience when you're on Siltep is this increased engagement or increased focus, desire to be engaged in whatever it is that you're doing. Okay. And then because we have elevated CAMP, that leads to increased long-term potentiation, LTP. Sure, sure, sure. So when we say focus and memory on the label, you know, that's how we're achieving it. And, you know, if you're better able to catalog the information that you take in while you're on it, you know, then you're better able to recall it later. Sure. Much more efficient. Better encoding, therefore better consolidation. Exactly. And, and better recall later. Um, so we've done some, some short, small tests with uh, memory champions who improve their recall mm -hmm. uh, after... Uh, using Siltep. Mm -hmm. uh, the other ingredients in the stack are acetyl-L-carnitine, which prevents Great. brain fatigue. Yep, yep. Um, in the early iterations of Siltep, people were crashing at like noon without the L-car. Interesting. So adding Interesting. that uh, prevented brain fatigue. And then there's phenylalanine for a slight kick Great. down that dopamine yep. pathway. So you get a little bit of motivation. Sure. Uh, and then B6, just to keep everything, you know, from you're, you're not missing out on that rate limiting factor. Yeah, so. absolutely. So that's wonderful. So um, it occurs to me, uh, phosphodiesterase um, being manipulated or suppressing it. Um, caffeine also uh, is broken down essentially by phosphodiesterase. Uh, do you get a potentiation of coffee or caffeine when there's siltep in your system? They certainly work synergistically. You do? Okay. Um, okay. I, I don't notice feeling... It's not profound. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I feel more caffeinated okay. by taking Siltep, okay. uh, but they definitely work together. So, um, you know, we, uh, Dave Asprey and Bulletproof, uh, you know, that's that's a, a strong relationship that we have. He mm -hmm. loves Siltep. We're the only non-Bulletproof product that they sell on their website. Okay. Um, he, he's a big fan of Siltep. So they definitely work synergistically if if you want to, uh, you know, either drink black coffee or add butter to it and do right. butter coffee. Right. And then, so when you make your own uh, bulletproof, are you butter and and uh, MCTs, or what's your what's I am, your recipe? Uh, I actually use ghee instead of butter. Okay, um, because 
I, I don't respond well to dairy. Oh, okay. Uh, so so I, without the dairy proteins, the ghee is the, just the fat? Is that is that true? I'm not, a, yes. I'm not totally familiar. I mean, I, I cook with ghee, but I don't mm-hmm. know what it is beyond a refined or a, a clarified it's butter. It's clarified butter. So you can make ghee at home, and basically what you do is you boil it until you get these solids at the top and skim them off. And those solids are uh, small amounts of dairy proteins. Okay. Uh, like if you look at the ingredient label of butter, it would say... Uh, zero protein, but mm-hmm. if you cook it, you will see some stuff There's come some, out. So, yeah, so there yeah. is some in there, and uh, so for me, I don't get that inflammatory response uh, from those dairy proteins with ghee, but I do get that from butter. Got it. Uh, for me, that manifests as like bloating, filmy skin. Uh, I actually get um, like a psoriasis or eczema type rash on my foot. Uh, okay, uh, and that's that's from always. The dairy. That's always an indicator for me, like if I have certain whey proteins or any kind of dairy protein, mm-hmm. uh, I, that always flares up. Oh, interesting. So, okay. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, I, you know, I used to do some uh, coconut oil and, and butter, but honestly, I like coffee's flavor way too much. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan, as I'm sure you are, of minimizing starches and sugars and maximizing fats in your diet. Mm-hmm. But I've gotten away from the bulletproof approach to coffee because I like coffee too much. I like the flavor. And if I actually had enough fat to make it, quote unquote, bulletproof, yep. it masks the flavor too much. So I have a tendency to get my fat in other sources like, you know, avocados and bacon and yeah, things you know, like that. I've actually gravitated more towards that recently. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when we were in your, your office this morning at Peak Brain, you guys were making coffee and it smelled so good. I was like, I've got to have <laughs> some of that. Uh, and I actually am drinking it black today. But but normally I would do, I do a French press at home. Mm-hmm. So for a full French press, I do about 20 grams of ghee and one tablespoon of uh, okay. Brain Octane. Okay. So it's not the full sure. heavy load. Maybe a half of what it, they it, would suggest. Yeah it's, yeah, it's enough to get you know, my, my vitamin K2 and, mm-hmm. and all the good stuff yep. from the ghee uh, and those fats but not enough to make it taste like butter and less like coffee. Because gotcha. I'm a huge fan of coffee, yeah. too. I just love coffee. Yeah, me too. I wake up in the morning with way too much blood in my caffeine stream. Um, so uh, uh, tell me what else you do to biohack personally. I mean, I'm assuming you're taking Siltep. Mm-hmm. You're doing, you know, doctored coffee to get the good fats and to have stable blood sugar and good, mm-hmm. you know, uh, MCT sort of uh, uh, brain metabolism being supported. Mm-hmm. What else are you doing day to day as a biohacking intervention beyond just living in a momentum sort of lifestyle? Yeah, I, I think... Um, there's there's so many things we could talk about in in a sense of like daily practices or habits uh-huh. um, that I don't know people would necessarily consider biohacks. Okay, like what do you mean? Yeah, what what, uh, what are things that just lifestyle versus? So, so I think uh, you know I have a morning routine. Okay, and and for me, you know, I I try to I try to make my day my own. I try to dictate my day uh-huh. as opposed to you know, so many people wake up and the first thing they do is they check their email, and to me that automatically puts you in a reactive or Absolutely. responsive. Yeah. Um, you know, scenario. So, you know, I'm not checking my email on my smartphone while I'm still laying in bed. Okay, good, um, good. You know, I, do, I don't do that. I actually won't check email until I do, until I accomplish the first thing, the one thing that's on my to-do list for that day. Okay. So to me, biohacking is is less about how many things can I add on to like what I do mm-hmm. it, as much as it is about how can I achieve maximal happiness, productivity, efficiency, motivation, whatever. So, so life hacking, not just body and biohacking. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not biohacking to collect uh, things to do. Yeah. Uh, now, right, every right. once in a while, I will do some experiments. And currently, for the sake of our podcast, I'm experimenting with um, a PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic field delta sleeper. Okay. Um, so that's a little, uh, it's like a two inch by sure. two inch square that I put below my clavicle yeah, yeah. and, uh, and I use that to induce delta waves and fall asleep faster. Okay. Um, Does it work on the chest because it's hit, heading the vagus nerve or what's uh, the, what's I the reason? I think it's supposed to be the brachial, oh, okay. uh, brachial plexus. plexus. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yep. Um, and so I'm doing that. I, I played with the ketones for, for a podcast that we did with Dominic Diagostino, mm-hmm. um, Let's see. I'm I'm testing some some heart rate variability uh, measurements to assess recovery and readiness, okay. which I think is phenomenal. Uh, I have not found the hardware yet that I like. Yep. That's, uh, yeah. That's, it's a big issue with HRV. I'm I've, finding the same problem. I've played with quite a few. The the chest strap for me is is a pain in the butt because you have to get it wet. I'm not going to sleep with it on. Right. So that means I have to wake up, get it wet, slap it on somehow. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of that. I'm playing with a finger sensor right now that uh-huh. hooks up uh, just like in the hospital when you have a sure. finger sensor yep. on. Yep. And it hooks straight into the yeah, headphones. Those are the most app. reliable, but they aren't necessarily easy to manage. It's actually not. It, it takes me anywhere from right now five to 20 minutes every morning to get a solid reading off really? of it. Really? Okay. Uh, okay. Which, 
that's not sustainable for me. Yep. I, I will do it temporarily, but um, you know the data is is invaluable. But mm-hmm. it's kind of a pain in the butt to to deal with that right now. Yeah, have uh, you tried the um, either the Aura Ring or the Bedit strip? That's the Aura Ring is next on my list. Yep. I, I actually had not heard about that until recently. Yeah, but, Ben Ben uh, Greenfield uh, introduced me to the Aura. It seems like an interesting device. Yeah, he, that's how data. that's how I was introduced yeah. to it. Uh, yeah, last ben week, Ben actually. introduces a lot of things to people. He's yeah. uh, he's all about the being the ambassador. So yeah, yeah. So I think those would be kind of like little hacks that that I'm doing. But I think on, going back to like what I was saying about practice and habits mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you know so so i'm a big you know to me productivity is a big thing mm-hmm. um and, and some of the productivity hacks uh that that i employ you know i don't check email often i try not to okay uh i'm not as good at that as how many times like a day do you uh plan at least to check email and to deal with you know the plan is yep. like three to five okay um Sometimes it's like more, late morning, midday, less. mid-afternoon, and then don't be stressed about reacting. Yeah, so constantly. so I'm a I'm a yellow legal pad guy. I, I, oh wow, I cannot, old school. I cannot live without that. I write everything down on that uh, every single day. I have a to do list written on there. Okay, and then on the right side, I have my one thing that if nothing else gets done, I do this thing. Okay, so I had a mentor or coach early on, and and he used the analogy of football mm-hmm. and three point four yards per play. Uh, his name is Paul Reddick, and if you play football or if you're familiar with the game, then you know that it takes 10 yards to get a first down. And as long as you don't get to fourth down, you never have to punt. And if they never stop you, you, you know, you're scoring a touchdown. Gotcha. Right? Yep. So the yep. goal of the game is to score points. Team with the most points wins. Sure, sure. So if you average 3.4 yards a play. You win, essentially. Or you at least you're, move you're the ball all, down the field. You're always moving the ball yeah, down the field. Yeah. You're always getting first downs. And that's, you know, to me, life, and whether it's business or whether it's working on neurofeedback, you know, if, if I'm a client of yours – and I'm working neurofeedback, the thing that you want to see from me is progress, that I'm, right. doing, I'm doing the work, I'm focusing on the actions, not the outcomes, to get there. Yep. And so for me, it's like that one thing that I write down on my to-do list, that's my 3.4 yards. If nothing else happens on this day, I got that done, and I do it first thing in the morning. So you're still, you're still moving the ball every single day. You're still making progress. Yeah. yeah, and then everything that I get accomplished after that for the rest of the day is gravy. Right, right, right. Um, right. You know, so I won't check email until after that. Um, I do that one thing. So kind of out of order here, but I wake up. I actually drink a morning detox drink every morning. Okay. And we can talk about that in a minute. All right. Uh, but as I'm drinking that, I'm drinking that as my coffee is brewing. Sure. And I go outside and I sit, I have a, we've got a front porch swing and I sit there if it's nice, if it's not, I'll sit down quietly inside. I do breath work, okay. kind of set my intentions for the day. Uh, sometimes it's gratitude journaling. Sometimes it's, um, you know, I've got this thing where I randomly, if I'm in a bad mood, I feel better when I check on other people or, or send encouragement to other people. Um, you know, so send a, a text to like five people and say, mm-hmm. you know, Hey, you got this or like, Hey, you cross my mind thinking about you, whatever, whatever you want to say to the people who, you know, are in your life. Um, so I do that. That takes about five minutes, go inside, get my coffee, go to my desk, knock out that one thing. Yep. And, and typically it's, you know, all that's accomplished by eight or eight thirty in the morning. And like I, my days, I, it's done. It's, Set, it's not yeah, done, yeah. but like I, I've had a productive day and it's really only just starting. And, you know, you build momentum, mm-hmm. you're focused, you, you and then you just roll from there. That's so. wonderful. So that's that's the first uh, hour, hour and a half, two hours of your day. Yeah. Uh, and I'm guessing that you aren't sitting on back and resting on your laurels the rest of the day. No, it's so. I, I have uh, I, I I call it like the the entrepreneur versus employee mindset. Where, okay. Where a lot of employees uh, they look at how can I make time pass at right. work. Like right. like if if you work an eight to five, you go into the the office and it's like okay. How little can I do between eight and five, and and make that time pass and, and get out? Now that's not everybody, but generally. But some jobs, sure, sure. Right? You're, you're you're marking time versus accomplishing tasks. Right. Yeah. And, and for me, it's completely opposite. It's okay. How much can I possibly get done? Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I gravitated towards the whole biohacking movement when it first you know kind of exploded onto the scene was wow, there's other people out there that think like me that want to get as much done as possible, yeah, yeah. want to move forward, that want to do you know be involved with as many amazing projects as possible. I mean, you've got a lot going on. You have a lot of different I projects. I tend to have a lot of plates uh, spinning, so to speak. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and it, was, it was cool to realize that there were other people like that and that there are people optimizing that and, and learning how to be better and more efficient at all that. So. Nice. Very cool. All right, let's switch to diet for a second. We should always talk about diet in these kind of uh, you know podcasts. Um, yeah. 
Uh, I'm guessing you're pretty congruent with uh, the way that I tend to eat, which is essentially leaning, uh, minimizing all starches and sugars, maximizing fats. Mm -hmm. But beyond that general rule, which I'm guessing is not a big surprise to most people who are in this space, um, what sorts of things do you adhere to? What have you found is really effective for cognitive, uh, you know, supporting good out, uh, uh, continued effort and cognitive uh, uh, output? Um, and what have you found can like throw you? You know, what are your big like? Oh, I did this today, and I'm going to have two days of fog or yeah, less that, productivity. That's a good question. So, uh, background on me: um, my degree is actually food science and human nutrition. Okay. Um, if I had done an internship after college, I would be an RD. Okay. But I had that chance to become a model, and it was you know, do I want to be an intern and pay to learn things that I already know that I don't agree with? Right. Um, or do I want to try to get paid to lift weights and you know? I was like, all right, well, Tough that choice. was that was yeah. a no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, in school, right away, you know, the curriculum was was split into two different sides. One side was uh, the the nutrition and the the programming, the uh, community type stuff. How do you teach? What are you what are you telling people to do? The other side was the science based stuff. Okay. So in the science based classes, you know, we took them all. Uh, microbiology, biochemistry, sure, organic sure. chemistry, you name it, I took it. And, and in those classes, you learn how the body works. And as a scientist, you've been there, you know, sure, and, sure. and if you understand systems, then you know how you can manipulate them and bend them to achieve whatever you want to yep. achieve. <clears throat> so I'm sitting in these classes, and that's just kind of how my brain works anyway, is I'm always thinking about it like that. And then I go into the, you know, the, the nutrition classes, and, and we've got, you know, an overweight, unhealthy looking teacher saying, avoid fat. Well, yeah. all foods fit, you know, it's okay to drink a, a can of Pepsi, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, like, I, I, yeah. I know you wouldn't be saying this if Kraft or Nabisco or General Mills was not paying for, you know, the programming, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so you, right away, I saw the influence of big food in, you know, everything that was going on. Yeah. But, you know, I am a minimal effective dose for carbohydrates okay. proponent. What and is that? What does that mean for you, effectively? I mean, women effective dose. I, I say it that way because I want to to try to clearly communicate that I'm not no carb. I'm not no yeah. carb. I'm not anti carbs. I realize that like the ketogenic diet has a, a ton of amazing benefits, um, and and I follow it myself most of the time. I do intermittent fasting, okay. and a majority of the time ketogenic. I will have carbs. You, I guess, you could call it a cyclical ketogenic. I don't mm -hmm. get caught up on you know, labeling it or, or mm -hmm. what it has to sure, be. Sure. Um, I am also a strength athlete. Right. And when I talked to Dominic Diagostino and, and Mike Nelson on our show, you know, they were in agreement with me that the more often, and this is, this is how I define minimal effective dose as well. The more often you're training at a high intensity, uh, the higher the intensity and the more frequently you do it, the greater your need physiologically for carbohydrates Absolutely. will be. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's impossible for me to say how many carbs or how frequently you need carbs uh, without knowing that. Yep. So yep. to me, that's the determining factor. Okay. So it's all about the glycogen reserve in muscles, essentially, that you're stripping away with intense exercise. Essentially. And, and if we can have, so, so Mike Nelson is a big proponent of what he calls metabolic flexibility, okay. the ability to go back and forth between either carbohydrates or uh, fats as a fuel source. Mm -hmm. And with Dom, it was the same thing. Uh, you know, he doesn't necessarily call it that, but... You know, if we are healthy and not dysfunctional, then we can do that. Right. And, and if you are generally fat adapted, you know, that's kind of where we want to stay. That's where we want to live. But for somebody like me or, or for somebody who maybe even more frequently, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a competitive CrossFit athlete. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if I was doing CrossFit five or six times a week, I'm going to need carbs more often than once or twice a week. Yep. Um, but and the idea is that we want to keep so, – so for me, I look at it as uh, – uh, time under the insulin curve. Oh, uh, great. That's Wonderful. what we want to, that's what we want to minimize. Yep. Not only in an acute, like daily, weekly, monthly setting, mm -hmm. but over our lifetime. So oh, interesting. I know as soon as I say that you, you can visualize it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. But if somebody's not a scientist, if you look going from left to right, you know, as time goes, uh, as time elapses, you're moving left to right on a graph, insulin will increase or, or spike following the ingestion of carbohydrates because they're always, no matter how good, quote unquote, good the carbs are, they're always broken down into glucose. Right. That's the usable form of energy. Um, with glucose, we get an insulin spike. That's how it clears through your blood. And that, as that spike is up, the longer it's up, 
then you have what we would call like area under that curve on the graph. So that's right. actually time under the insulin curve. We want to minimize that on, um, like I said, on a daily, weekly, monthly, and lifetime basis. So, so you know, as Mark Sisson says that you want you want to burn as much burn as little sugar over your lifetime as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I say you know minimum effective dose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if, if you're if you're so so you do some people do need carbohydrates, and if we have them, if we eat them, you know, we want to we want to get that window up and then close it yep. as quickly as we can and get back to, you know, fats for a fuel source, minimizing that time under the insulin curve. So, so for me, it's, it's almost like the default setting is being fat adapted or ketogenic sure, or sure. whatever. Um, and then, you know, having carbs when you need them, um, you know, as needed. Sure. So. Now for, from my perspective, I would sort of conceptualize that as, um, remaining insulin sensitive, mm -hmm. keeping your cells sensitive to the oscillatory signal of insulin, in the signal that goes up when you have sugars and goes down when you don't. And so for you, it's about not pegging insulin, keeping it up. From my perspective, the lack of variability of signaling molecules in the brain and body means that the systems receiving that signal become less sensitive to the signal. And that's one of the things that, that leads to deg degradation in cortisol and insulin and everything else. Yeah. Um, but uh, the way that I typically manage that is just minimizing carbs unless I'm maximizing carbs. I sort of have a, you know, uh, I'm, I'm perfect 80% of the time. Yeah. And then, you know, we have ice cream on those other days. Uh, but uh, for you, it sounds more like you're thinking about the, the, the length of exposure, if you will, to the, the sugar signal. Um, mm -hmm. When do you do your carbs? Is it right after you work out hard, you have empty muscles, and you're refeeding that 50 grams of glycogen that you can take in? Or are you doing it before sleep for GH bur bursts or... When I do it personally uh, is is different than when I recommend it for most people. Okay, and that's only because, like I said, I do intermittent fasting. And so I, what does that mean for you? Is that a window of eating, or I typically eat one meal a day. Okay, mid midday kind of thing. Midday, somewhere uh -huh. between two and four p.m. Okay, so so that's why I say what I do. Like I'm not going to recommend that to other people. Sure. Now, if other people do it, great. Okay, here's how we can do it. But I realize that most people will hear that and they're like, "Oh, that's weird." <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so. For me, it's just if it's going to be a carb day, then I have them in that meal. Okay. So it's it's really easy for me to figure out when to have them, right? Because I'm right. only eating right. once. Really, yeah. Um, now, that's not to say like, you know, there are uh, anomalies or there's days where I travel. Like today we may have a small lunch and then a small dinner and I'll just basically have two meals. You okay. know, I'll take what I would normally eat, yep. divide it into two. But but yes, I think to for me, I think about it as a window and it's... If I had to put a time on it, it's probably a 20-hour fast and a four-hour feeding window. Okay, okay. Uh, if it's one meal, it's usually like an hour uh, feeding window. Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, I would have my carbs then. And, then, you know, for, for other people, I think later in the day, we know we're better able to handle carbohydrates later in the day. I, I'm a big proponent of not having carbs with breakfast. Okay. Um, we know what the hormonal profile of our body looks like early in the day when we wake mm -hmm, up. Cortisol mm -hmm. should be peaking. Yep. Uh, if we don't mess with that, then, you know, we get the growth hormone, we get glucagon, we get uh, ghrelin, and that cascade promotes fat loss. It promotes mental clarity, uh, and it is actually uh, muscle preserving with, mm -hmm, with mm -hmm, the growth hormone. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that, that we can do to really screw up our mornings uh, that way is to introduce carbohydrates because as we said earlier, you're going to have insulin, then you're going to have insulin present when cortisol is at its highest. And those two things don't play nice, right? No, those are the two storage hormones, one stress, one storage, and, and they don't play nice. That leads to uh, cloudiness in your brain, brain mm -hmm. fog, uh, as well as fat storage. So like the two things that basically define optimal performance you're you're going to screw up. Right, right. So so, so uh, just so I, can, I understand, I'm actually not uh, a biochemist. So when you spike insulin through dietary sugars, you suppress cortisol? Is that the direction it goes in? No, you wouldn't suppress it because so the cortisol peaking in the morning is what helps you get out of bed. And that's basically our circadian rhythm sure, uh, sure. or your biological clock. So cortisol should actually be at its lowest uh, around like 6, 7, 8 p.m. Mm-hmm. And then it peaks around 3, around, 4 a.m. or something? Uh, a little bit after that, okay. actually. It, but it starts to rise at that time. And it will actually peak around 6, 7, 8 a.m. Okay. And it's different for everybody. Sure, sure. But basically, it, it should kind of follow, like, you know, the, the sun and, and, you know, dark schedule. Yep. But it peaks. And then as long as we don't do anything to disrupt that cortisol pathway, 
it's going to slowly trend down from first thing in the morning until later in the evening. Now, anybody who has driven in LA traffic or works a desk job or basically lives the typical 2016 lifestyle, there, there's so many things that disrupt cortisol. Sure. But when cortisol and insulin are both you know, present, they, they don't play nicely and you know, it does lead to that fat storage. So it's not that it disrupts the cortisol mm -hmm. pathway uh, as much as just you just don't want them both elevated. At the so is the insulin more disrupting secondary things cortisol will be producing? I mean, uh, I know there's some relationships between growth hormone for both cortisol and for insulin. Yeah. So if, if you do introduce insulin at that time in the morning, you're going to prevent... Uh, well, first of all, you would definitely prevent glucagon because glucagon and insulin are, are inverse. Yep. Um, and then you would not get the growth hormone release. You would not get ghrelin. Uh, okay. because you're having the carbohydrates, you're having uh, insulin secreted. Yeah, yep. so, interesting. Yeah. Hey, let's go back to a second um, to the education thing you're talking about. So you have a degree in food science. Yes. Um, I've been seeing a lot of this, you know, of course, we're both in this sort of uh, uh, biohacking world where we're both focused on ways of eating, which to a large extent fly in the face of conventional wisdom for the past 50 years. Now, I think both you and I would agree that conventional wisdom is bullshit right. um, with, with regards to diet and nutrition. Uh, and I, I feel that it was bad marketing in the 70s and 80s that really put us on this really bad path for obesity, diabetes, cancer, mm -hmm. and even Alzheimer's, which is really driven by blood sugar dysregulation mm -hmm. to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you're preaching to the choir here, but I, I, I come across people who are interested in doing... Uh, dietitian or nutritionist programs or studying, you know, biochemistry and, and food science. And they often get, I mean, people who I, I often uh, uh, interact with are, are believers of this paleo primal mm -hmm. keto approach. And they get very frustrated when they try to find an actual education program mm -hmm. that has, the, I mean, there is science out there showing that keto is pretty good for your brain. Right. Um, there's no science out there that's actually good science that shows that fat is bad for your brain. Uh, at least not recently, and all the, the studies in the 70s and 80s that showed fat was bad didn't control for sugar. So it's fat and sugar is very, very bad, but sugar is kind of bad in the absence of fat, and fat's not bad at all in the absence of sugar. So I'm wondering if you, uh, as a sort of you know, food scientist guy, have discovered that there are, there, there's, a, there's a shift or not towards embracing you know, some of the, the science around these high fat, low carbohydrate, low starch based diets. Are you seeing the, the, the field of food science shift at all? Or is it still stuck 20, 30 years ago? You know, I was so disenchanted with okay. the academic world um, that I haven't visited it or, or seen it since I left college. When was that? When, that was what, what, 2008. Okay, so still pretty recent. Um, and, and like I said earlier in, in our talk, you know, mm -hmm. when I was in school, we were taught one thing in the science classes and then the nutrition curriculum was completely opposite of that. And that's, you see this, as you put it, conventional wisdom, but it was clearly paid for by big food mm -hmm. then, which it was, you know, as we know, there was that New York Times article that came out a few yep. uh, weeks ago, you know, where the Harvard scientists were paid by the sugar industry to fudge and say that. You know, it was fat that was the enemy, not sugar, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that set the precedent in the late 60s that formed the last half a century yeah. of what was taught, what was promoted, you know, big food, the, the all the government regulations, it's all opposite what we hear in yeah. paleo, keto, you know, new science worlds. So, you know, academia will always lag behind uh, yes. cutting edge research. It just, it has to. You, and, you... and marketing gets in the, way, in the way and gets stuck. I mean, we, you know, we think that fat is bad culturally in, in Western size because we're told that on TV with every commercial for the past, you know, 30 years. Right. Um, by the same token, I mean, I, I'm a, of course a brain guy. Um, this feels very similar to this idea that we have a chemical imbalance in our brain. The chemical right. imbalance theory of mental illness is utter bunk. There's, there's been no ever, not one bit of shred of evidence that you can have a chemical imbalance. Chemical imbalance in the brain are what happened right before you die. Right. Like the only time you have a chemical imbalance is before you die or when you have a seizure. Otherwise, it's a regulatory domain that's very complicated, but the absolute level of a neurotransmitter is really meaningless unless you know everything else about the circuit, receptor density, phosphorylation, and even then it's very imperfect. This strikes me as that where it's sort of thought to be true, but it's really sort of secondary to what's probably real. Well, and it's really frustrating because, you know, you, you can't fight the government. Right. You can't fight big food. We're doing a great job of, of you know, getting the, the whole grass fed, the pasture mm -hmm. raised, the, all of that is growing. 
but the if if you still have that I think it's a generational thing too like sure people my age and younger are very inclined to uh you know seek out their own information seek out alternative sources yep. you know their their main source of information input is not you know the local news at 6 p.m. where my parents generation sure. and older you know that's whatever whatever is said there or whatever my doctor says that's gospel sure. and that's that's an interesting thing and it's very hard to fight conventional wisdom in those demographics yeah, yeah. but but the younger generations and people who are more inclined to seek out information on their own yep that information, we're getting it out there, and and I think we're definitely making that change. And you're seeing so many mm-hmm. signs of that. I mean, you see, you know, Whole Foods are everywhere now. You see things that are grocery stores and, and markets that are even, you know, on a higher level than than sure, Whole Foods. Sure. Uh, Erewhon, uh, exactly. Sprouts is a sort of a lower end Whole Foods that is, you know, got yeah. more selection. So and, so, yeah. so we see that. We see, you know, there's there's so many podcasts like this. There's um, alternative education you know, mm-hmm. uh, outlets, uh, we're getting it out there. People are interested in it. They want it. But, but in academia that will always lag research because you have to have follow up sure. studies. You know, nobody's going to teach anything until they're sure of it. But also you have to remember that those, those programs are funded by the people that we're basically trying to out or oust, you know, yeah. with, with this new research. So I, I don't see that changing without some kind of, you know, cataclysmic. I think you event. might be right. Although I will say my mom, who is, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I think she's 68, uh, um, eats paleo, mm-hmm. exercises three hours a day, and calls me for paracetam refills every three months. But, so, but where did she get that information? She got it because she we have a lot of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's in the family, and she was very concerned, and I'm a neuroscientist, and so, you know, she's... So my point is, she got she it got from it you. She got it from me. She didn't yeah, get it yeah, from, yeah. you know, the local Conven- news exactly. or... or yep. Right. So, uh, so I think it's up to us to continue to you know, be relentless and tireless with what we're doing sure, yeah. to try to get that information out there because it's certainly not going to come from mainstream. So let's speak more about um, sort of misinformation. Uh, earlier, and not, 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 to, not to jump on you, earlier you mentioned the word detox. And for me, that's a, that's a hot button term. <laughs> uh, uh, what did you mean by, you said you drink yep. a detox drink yep. every morning. Tell me more about so what you're doing there. I call it a detox drink. I'm not into detoxes or cleanses. Okay. Okay, I good. hate that stuff. Thank you. But it needed a name, uh-huh. and, and morning detox drink is what I call it because really all it is. Uh, so originally, I've been doing this every morning for like seven, year, eight years. Um, Anne Louise Gittleman, uh, first lady of nutrition, she is big on like fat flush and, and detoxification. Um, she was a big proponent of warm water first thing in the morning okay. with organic lemon juice. Yep, warm sure, water sure. opens up the digestive system. Um, you don't want to wake up and drink ice cold water because everything will clench up and sure. you know, that's not a good way to start the day. Right. Um, but lemon has a compound in it, d uh, which is highly researched. Uh, mm-hmm. It has even anti-cancer properties, but it also supports liver function, yep. which, you know, the liver is the body's filtration system. So it can have detoxification properties, but it also helps with bile production, yep. the, the lemon and the D-limione, which for those of us following a high fat diet is incredibly Huge. important yeah. because if we yeah. can't metabolize the fat that you're eating, you're not really... stones and all kinds exactly, of problems. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the, the drink is warm water with uh, a tablespoon of organic lemon juice, a tablespoon of raw apple cider vinegar. Uh, I do a teaspoon of sea salt. Some people can do a little bit less. It depends on your size. And then I do a dash of cayenne. So that's my drink. It didn't have a name. It was something I formulated myself. So so that's where morning detox drink came from. I I certainly don't see it as like a cleanse or a detox. Um, But, you know, the the benefits of apple cider vinegar are, are, you know, they're they're widespread. They're huge. Um, The salt helps uh, upregulate blood pressure every morning. Yep, osmotic so, uh, pulling that water into your cells yep. with the salt. Yep. And, and that actually protects uh, the adrenals, which, okay. you know, in our life, again, anything we can do to protect uh, adrenal function sure, sure. helps. Um, and the cayenne has uh, metabolic uh, enhancing properties. And, you know, so I just, I drink that and it, it wakes me up. It's, it's Wonderful. not, it's not caffeine. Um, there's nothing wrong with caffeine, but you yeah, know, yeah, it has a whole lot of health promoting. Well, I'm, benefits. I'm glad you didn't fall down on the side of actually saying it was detoxing cells. I mean, of course, as you probably know, there is no way to, you can you cannot put toxins in your body to clear out you know things, but you can't accelerate the natural process of removing toxins from cells. It's just happening all the time. Right. And if you drink, you know, 
special drinks or do special diets, you're not going to actually clear things out of your system. It, it sort of falls into that category of things like quantum or 10% yeah. of your brain or other sort of urban legends of biohacking that just aren't remotely true. So, Well, I'll enlist your help to help me come up with a new name for it. All right. There we go. There we go. Cool. So um, uh, you're, you're, you're flying around the world. You're doing all kinds of things. Uh, I'm just curious. I mean, you're here in LA. It's a Friday morning. Um, what did the past week or so look like in terms of where, where, you know, who have you seen? Where have you been? What kind of ventures have you had? I mean, how many different directions are you moving in, in this, uh, you know, sort of evangelist, biohacker, kind of chief visionary kind of uh, perspective you have? Yeah. So it's been crazy. Um, let's see. Last weekend was actually, uh, a weekend at home. So I'm trying to go back to last Friday. That was, that was probably my first weekend at home, uh, with my wife, uh, in a long time. So uh -huh. we both enjoyed that tremendously. Sure, sure. Um, the weekend before that, uh, I was in Austin, Texas at an event called the Vanguard. Okay. Uh -huh. And, uh, one of our natural stacks co-founder and I, uh, Ben were there and that was a, a 48 hour, basically the ultimate man camp. Okay. But there were females there as well. So, uh, I, I, I think the ultimate man camp includes women. Well said. You know, um, but it, it, that's an event run by some special forces guys okay. and some of their friends, and it's a really cool thing that they have. It's basically their circle of friends, and what they've done is they have. It, it, it's I have not been lucky enough to be introduced to the XPT. Uh, oh sure, group, yeah, yeah. But it it's, sounds, it's, sounds similar. It's a very similar thing there, where you have this group of high performers, and yeah. each one has their own skill set that yep. they bring to the group, and as a collective group. They're getting better by focusing, you know, you're becoming a more well-rounded individual by attacking uh, and learning where you're weak and, yeah. and bringing those yeah. things up to the strength. So, you know, we, we did 90-minute uh, instructional blocks on some survival skills, land navigation, butchery. So we actually butchered our own uh, chickens on Friday, and then we had them for dinner on Saturday. So, you know, you really get to see where your food comes from. It's mm -hmm. a very intimate relationship with your food. And, I mean, as a hunter... I've had that experience before, but never. But a lot of people don't have the reference of where their meat's coming from. Exactly. And so they, they're able to ignore lots of things, political, health-wise, yes. you know, around this thing I'm eating. So. Yeah. So back to your question, yeah. I mean, that was, that was a really a cool experience to be around people who are, they're high performers in their own right, but they're also, mm -hmm. um, th they're not getting complacent and they're, they're always pushing to try to get better. So to get to be around people like that is phenomenal. Um, they also own two of those guys who run that own a gym called Atomic Athlete in Austin, Texas. Okay. Amazing gym. So that's where I lift when I'm in Austin. Um, one of the cool things about traveling like I do is, is I get to create these relationships almost in every major city. So I, I know people that run amazing facilities in, in every Mm -hmm. city. So mm -hmm. I know, I know where I float when I'm in Austin. I know where I float when I'm in LA. Uh -huh. I know, you know, which gym I go to. Uh, so, so just on this LA trip, we got out here Tuesday night, we saw you Wednesday morning. We got the baseline readings on the EEG. Mm -hmm. Um, went from there to, uh, a gym here called Deuce Gym, uh, which was actually the, the epicenter of the butter coffee. Oh, really? Uh, bulletproof stuff that's their story uh, sure, I'll, sure. I'll, i can introduce you it and may be apocryphal but that's okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um and uh so we did that we, we did something else we, we were we were at erewhon which is one of those stores uh where yep. we were doing staff training um so that they're better able to educate the customers we did a demo i got to run into a bunch of people who are other influencers at erewhon you know we were back with you meeting with some other uh, champions and ambassadors this afternoon. We'll be at Bulletproof uh, Coffee Shop. Um, there's a, a home show tomorrow where I'm meeting with uh, Klaus, a guy from Samina Beds, which mm -hmm. is the world's healthiest bed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's just everybody who's into some aspect of uh, health and wellness and, and fitness optimization, um, you know, we're, we're lucky enough to have interactions with them. And every time we travel, I'm like, okay, Who's out there yeah, that we yeah. have a relationship with and, and you know, let's, yeah. let's, let's touch base with them. Let's stay in contact and, you know, foster those relationships. Great. Yeah. I mean, I was on your, we, we, we recorded a, an audio podcast, uh, two weeks ago or something. And mm -hmm. then I get to see you twice this week when you're in LA. Should yeah. we talk about, should you pull back the covers a little on your, on your brain for uh, our listeners? Let's do it. All right. Nice. So, um, for folks that have either seen the show or are familiar with quantitative EEG, this is an assessment process we do, which compares one person's brain to a normative database, essentially. And you end up with... Uh, heat maps, you know, statistics that say how unusual your brain is. We did yours um, a couple days ago, totally clean, no caffeine, no siltep, and your brain looked a little bit uh, inattentive. 
essentially. It was really healthy overall. Um, I often see many, many more things. If uh, you see Ben's show, you'll see that there's, it's, it was pretty horrible to start. Um, but but uh, Your Brain Ryan was actually really quite intact, performant, no anxiety markers, no sleep issues, no head injuries, really pretty clean, except you made about two to three standard deviations higher amounts of alpha waves, eyes open and eyes closed, than the average person who's your age, your gender, et cetera. Now, what that probably translates to functionally is a little bit of inattention, getting stuck in being spacey. You know, you might even have been called something like ADD, you mm -hmm. know, 20, 30 years ago. We don't mm -hmm. use that label anymore for that problem. But um, inattentive, essentially. Inattentive. Some issues with sh shifting attention, being stuck in neutral, being a little spacey. My wife would agree with the would she? Okay, she, she, she listened to us laughing as, as we, we speak, probably. Um, and then today you came in and we did exactly the same thing. Another QEG resting baselines, nothing fancy. But you had silt up in your system. Uh, and the difference was all of the alpha excesses dropped by about a standard deviation. Now, to put that in context, when we actually make changes in brains with neurofeedback, which is one of the few things that can permanently change a brain, we get about one to two standard deviations in about three months of aggressive training. And with one dose of Siltep, probably not a permanent change, obviously, but you get a, you get a baseline shift of equivalent to a month or two of hardcore work on your brain. So I think that, you know, it's, so it's an end of one, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we should maybe talk about doing a little bit larger ends. Definitely. But, but um, uh, this is how you do research is you first see what happens on the individual level. Mm -hmm. um, your brain waves are, are you know, essentially self-blinding because you can't control them. And we saw a statistically significant change, dropping excess alpha, meaning that you would should you should I would assume feel more crisp, more alert, more engaged, and that's sort of what you described the effects of Siltep in general. Anyways, producing that sense of engagement versus maybe checking out a little bit. Yeah, and, and I mean I, I was hoping that that's what we would see, uh -huh. but until we do it, you don't know. And and right. I was really really excited to to see those results, and you know. The interesting thing to me is that I only take one pill, and the, yeah. the dose so for the low dose, yeah. yeah, the dose for Siltep is is three pills, and and I've just seen over experimentation, over the years that I actually do best with one pill. So it'd be mm -hmm. interesting to see, like you said, with a an N larger than one. So we'll sure. definitely talk about that. And I think that's something that, as a company, we want to pursue. Um, you know, research and quantification and, and all of that stuff. So um, we are actually underway with some clinical trials now. Mm -hmm. But as you know, those take a long time. They do. They're so, complicated. They're expensive. They're 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 so time consuming. Yeah. And then your data is never quite what you want it to be when you're done. <laughs> so. Yeah. And and for us, it's going to be. 18 months to, to two years before we have that result. Which is a fast likely. study. I th that, that is a fast human study. We actually, uh, the guy leading it is the world's leading researcher on PDE4. Oh, okay. Uh, and because that's Perfect. the mechanism sure, of action, sure. yeah. uh, that's that's the way we went with that. But I think that's probably all I can say on the study for now. But we sure. want something that's, you know, uh, faster to, yep. to, yep. to yep. get the results out. And then I think with, with some EEG readings, that would be amazing. But, you know, it's funny that you, you mentioned, you know, the, or I guess seeing the original brain scan, well, the one without Siltep was, was, I guess, not, I don't want to say valuable, but validating for sure. me. Yeah. Because it's like, that's, I know, you know, I, my, I tend to be very fast thinking. I tend to definitely see things kind of big picture and, and I'm very, um, you know, it's very hard to hold my attention for, yeah. for a long time. I, I, I'm just curious. I want to know as much as I can. I want to move quickly. And that's pretty much what, the brain scan showed. It did. And, you know, sometimes seeing these patterns in your brain, it goes, oh, this is not a function of my willpower. I'm not just being lazy. My brain is oriented or tuned to do specific things better and some other things not as well. Um, I think that the QEG process can also often be very validating. It's like, oh, oh, great. There's some of my strengths. Here's some weaknesses. It's real. Mm -hmm. It's not a function of willpower or failure or... You know, we, we, someone's got a broken leg, you don't go, why aren't you running down the block? But if somebody has inattention, it's like, why aren't you paying attention? We, we don't see the invisible brain things as valid physical things until we actually look at brain activity and say, oh, well, here's your inattention or here's your impulsivity, or, here's your sleep issue. And I think it can be very, you know, grounding in terms of thinking about what your, you know, how your performance levels can, be, can vary. Yeah, and I think you said a, a, something really valuable for, for listeners is that, you know, Back to what we were saying in the beginning, you know, we're, we're looking at long, like life hacks and long term mm -hmm. hacks, habits, practices, you know, that's definitely where neurofeedback would fall in. You're, you're, you're doing something that changes your brain, you know, beyond just short term or transient nootropics give you that short term, that 
Yep. That transient, okay, we, we changed it today. That's a state, not a trait. Absolutely. And yep. it's it's amazing to see that Siltep can can produce that that state shift. That state yeah, shift that yeah, we want yeah. on a single day with a single dose, even a single pill. Yep. But combining that with something like neurofeedback to where you're getting that long term shift of, you know, not a state but a trait. That could be really, really powerful. It could be, and there might be something where the PD4 actually enhancing. I mean, neurofeedback is learning. It's just basic learning. Right. I mean, we're doing some fancy things to tell the brain what to learn, but it's it's not tapping into some magical technique. It's really just tapping into long term potentiation. PD4. So there might be something where we get accelerated gains. You know, there's a there's an Ashtanga yoga studio right next to my neurofeedback center, mm -hmm. and I find when people do both hardcore physical exercise and brain training they seem to have faster changes in the brain. Well, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that, that you, as a neuroscientist, you know that, that exercise can increase BDNF. Massively, which, yeah. You know, yeah. Brain-derived neurotrophic factors, neurogenesis, you, you get brain, you know, new, basically new brain cells. And, you know, there, there's studies that show just walking for 20 minutes increase brain activity, which potentiates, you know, learning or, or anything. Absolutely, so, yeah, yeah. Um, You know, Thomas Edison, I, I love a quote from him that says the, the main function of the body is to carry the brain around. And... You know, movement and optimal brain health are not independent things. Um, yep, absolutely. You, you, you very rarely, I'm sure there are exceptions, but very rarely will you see people that are operating on a high level that are ignoring one or the other. Right. I mean, in, in, in if you are sedentary or not physically active, I mean, I'm, I'm a gerontologist and we often think about minimum level of physical activity to avoid risk factors Mm -hmm. burgeoning. Right. And for cardiovascular risk, which of course is, is involved heavily in aging as well as young sort of health, um, I think the current uh, guesstimate is less than 7,000 steps per day is a health risk to the cardiovascular system equivalent to a two-pack of cigarette habit a day. I have not heard that. That's crazy. So if you're sitting on your butt watching TV, even if you're you know using your mind, using your attention and, and staying effortlessly engaged mm -hmm. mentally, if your body is not, if the cardiovascular system isn't being stretched and challenged by your uh your your activity then it's actually a cardiovascular risk i'm looking at my fitbit right now yeah which what's your heart uh, right there, yeah. <laughs> well i'm looking at my steps i've only taken 1900 steps uh -oh, today, so uh -oh. I, need, I need about 5,000 more steps right. but, but it's interesting um my wife got one of these recently and and i was so like jealous of her having that data all the time I was, uh -huh. all right i gotta get one of those um but uh, i will probably get that aura ring instead because that will give me the same stuff, but also mm -hmm. the HRV, which to right. me, that's the more valuable information, but it is kind of fun to look at steps. And, you know, it's interesting that, you know, I've would consider myself fairly active. I know that when I ran the gym and I was on my feet and moving, I was a lot more active than I am now yep. where I'm, you know, standing at a desk. Most of the time I do my best to stand up. Uh, I know that that doesn't do a whole lot, but at least I'm standing instead of sitting. Okay. But for me to get 7,000 steps, I probably average between five and 7,000 a okay. day. Um, 5,000 used to be the old number to avoid uh, decline with age. So it's just, it's so, interesting. So get north of five, definitely. Yeah. You can. But, but to me, like looking at my data, I know for me that that's close to like three to four miles a day. But if you think evolutionary, humans are supposed to walk at least three to four miles a day. Yeah. I mean, we, we, yeah. we've done that for you know, how many thousands of years, right. yeah. only until the last hundred years. And, yeah. you know, that... Yeah, for a hundred thousand years, we've, we've been walking everywhere. And for a hundred years, we've been sitting on yeah. our butts. Yeah, and to scale, that's, you know, such an insignificant portion of yeah. time. And, and it's not enough time for our bodies to, to adapt. Yeah, to evolution that. has not occurred in the past 100 years no. on, on humans. We no. haven't evolved. Yeah, no, two yeah. generations didn't change anything. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, I mean yes, yeah, actually they did, but not, not fundamental things, just right. expression. Like, you know, right. you are experiencing metabolic uh, species of, of, of chemicals based on, on the stressors your parents experienced and your grandparents experienced turning on certain genes. Right. But grossly... There has not been a change in the human creature for tens of thousands of right, years, right? right. So yeah, and that's I guess to to me that was kind of like the eye opener where it's like, wow, you know, three or four miles, you know, we should we should be doing that, yeah, you know, yeah, very very easily. Cool. All right, let's let's uh, let's go. we're coming to the end of our hour here, but let's um, first ask you, uh, do you have any general advice or takeaways for people when you're you're talking in this biohacking, brain health, body health, performance space? What are some of the bits of wisdom you love to drop or, or a, a just single piece of advice that you think is important to a perspective shift, an actual item, whatever it is. But what are some things you always, oh, I got to make sure to tell people this. I think to me it would be on the, on the perspective shift side. Um, okay. I, I just 
I just want every single person to, to take control of their own life, to realize like, for me, we get, we get one go at this thing. Mm -hmm. And my biggest fear is getting to the end of it and not having experienced something. Okay. Uh, I don't want to have, I I hate that, like no regrets or you only live once. Right. But you know, it's so true. I mean, I, I want my life to be filled with as many amazing experiences as possible. I want to learn as much as possible. I want to share that with, you know, the greatest people, you know, that I can possibly surround myself with. And, mm-hmm. and so I guess my advice or, or the one thing that I would want people to know is just, you know, you are in control, you know, you captain your own ship, make this life as, as great as you can. Okay. Um, and I think adopting that or, or living that mindset for me makes biohacking something that I want to do because it, it helps me optimize that experience. Absolutely. Um, so I, that, that's what I would say. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Ryan. Um, can you tell our listeners where they can find you, where they can get involved and, and figure out the different projects you're working on and pro- products you're working on? Yeah. Uh, wh- where can they hunt you down? So personally, um, Instagram is Ryan Muncy underscore. Um, I'm on Facebook. But uh, most of what I'm working on, you will find uh, through the Optimal Performance Podcast. And that is... I hear that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we have some great high-profile guests on there. Um, but uh, Optimal Performance Podcast and then Natural Stacks is the company and at Natural Stacks on all social media. Uh, all of the cool stuff that we're working on, you, you'll hear about through there, uh, either on the newsletter or on great. the podcast. So Ryan Muncy underscore on Instagram or at Natural Stacks on all social media. You can check Ryan out, ask him questions. I'm sure he'd love to hear from you about your own individual brain journey. And if you're using Siltep or if you're doing different you know, physical things, uh, I'm sure like you're sort of an, a scientist the way I am. And you always want to find what individuals are doing that's really working because yep. everyone's uh, their own little test bed. So. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for coming on the show today, and I'm sure we'll be working uh, in the future together. Um, folks, this has been another episode of Head First with Dr. Hill. Uh, take care of those brains, and we'll talk to you soon. 